Hi, I'm Andy Shaw Rogers. I am head of suppliers here at Common Objective, and I'm delighted to introduce this session of Co Expo, which is all about jewelry and accessories. We've reached day five of Expo, and throughout today, we've been focused on authentic luxury. Please do post in the chat, uh, introduce yourself, your business, uh, tell us where you're joining us from today. We have people from all over the world, and it's fantastic to to see where everyone is calling in from. And if you're comfortable, we'd also love to see you. Uh, could you, if you turn your camera on, that would be amazing. Uh, I see a lot of my co-colleagues, we're like family, but I do see an awful lot of them and it would be nice to see some other faces too. Uh, the rest is to see, yeah, all of the co-community. Uh, we're having an incredible week. Uh, new partnerships are forming between suppliers and brands. We've heard stories of, of, of all sorts of collaborations that have been going on over many years, uh, which is inspiring new beginnings. There's been rigorous debate. There's been outstanding input from partners, suppliers and visitors. Uh, and there's been an enthralling Q&A sessions throughout each session, really, uh, with leaders and pioneers. So today uh, is all about jewelry and accessories. And our speakers today, these are people you're going to hear from. Uh, during this session. Uh, we've got Tamsin Lejeune, who is CEO and founder of Common Objective. There's Laurent Lohmann, who heads up our partnerships and will be bringing us the trends during the session. We've got Victoria War, co-founder of the inspiring collaborative v, &V business. Madeline Green, Madeline Green, founder of the pioneering Ammo Jewelry Company. We're really delighted to have Victoria and Madeline here with us today and, and, and excited to, to have your expertise and input in just a few moments. Plus, as it's the final session of the week, I wanted to give a particular mention to the co-team who are not on this slide, but are in the room. Uh, Marielle is going to be hosting a breakout session in her fantastically enthusiastic, exuberant, life-affirming way. Melanie has painstakingly researched and eloquently crafted the trends input for this and all expo sessions. Victoria, who has masterfully devised, formulated and crafted all the graphics and slides that you see today and the rest of the time during expo. Monisha has eagerly elite and brilliantly assisted with research, marketing and communications. And Ellie, arguably the most unflappable member of the team, has, amongst many other things, masterminded all things required to make the tech run smoothly. And more importantly, as you will experience later, make sure we all know how to make the most of the tech without messing it up. So moving on to the agenda, uh, we're going to have an overview of the topic, including trends brought to us by Laurent. We're going to have a Q&A with Victoria and Madeline. We're then going to have an introduction to all the suppliers, all the exhibitors in this session. Uh, we're then going to move into breakout sessions, which have been really, really excellent uh, this entire week. Uh, there are time when more questions can be asked of the suppliers uh, and where we can have some really good conversations. And finally, we'll be wrapping it back up in the main room uh, here in this same room in Zoom, uh, where there'll just be a few moments uh, to share a few more things. So to make the most of Expo, uh, as I've already said, it'd be amazing if you could post in chat. Please do say who you are. Uh, please connect on Common Objective. Uh, if you go to someone's uh, profile, you can connect with them. And uh, the profile, the links to those profiles will be posted to, in the chat to the exhibitors. But also please do uh, post your own profile links as well. You can also bookmark each other on the Common Objective platform. Uh, just to let you know as well, at the end of the session or, or at any point throughout, um, you can save the chat. So if you save the chat now, you won't have the stuff that's about to happen. So if you do it at the end, that's ideal. And to save the chat, you click on the three dots. Um, when you open the messaging box, uh, there's three dots at the bottom. Click on that and you simply select save chat. So I'm going to hand over to Tamsin now, who's going to introduce you how to access, introduce you how to access all that Common Objective has to offer. Thank you, Andy, and for your wonderful introduction to the team. So yes, uh, I'm sure that most of the people in the room now by now are members of Co. But if you're not, it's very easy to be a part of this community. It takes you a few minutes. You can sign up and worth doing now if you're not already on so that you can connect with everybody in the room. Um, on Co, you have a matching profile, so you can enter in information 
the site gives you what you need on a dashboard from information to tools to connections, individuals, businesses, buyers, suppliers. Um, so get those preferences right. You can fix those at any point on your dashboard to the top right, update them, say what you do, what you, what you offer, what you're looking for and connect a message. So throughout this session, we're gonna be posting the links to the business profiles for the businesses we're promoting. Each of those has individuals connected with them and you can connect a message direct. You can also create a business profile if you don't have one already, um, it's free to do. It allows you to promote your business and the more sustainable your business, the higher your search ranking, the highest ranking businesses get 2,700% more views than the lowest ranking. So it's really worth spending some time to enter in information. And we know that some of our businesses, suppliers and brands are getting most of their business through Co. So it really is worth um, spending time to get your profile right. And you will also be automatically entered into the awards when you create a business profile. And if you stay to the end, you'll hear a bit more about the awards. Um, so I'm gonna pass back to Andy. Oh, I'm going to pass to Laurel, apologies, to share the trends for this session. Tabs, and thank you so much. Uh, and uh, also to you, Andy, absolutely. I think it was my favorite intro I've heard all week, and we've done it a couple of times. So thank you so much uh, for that. Good. My name is Laurent. Uh, to everybody who's joined a little bit later, also a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, the trends are going to be presented by me. It's going to be a quick two minute thing, but it serves the purpose of getting us into the mood of our understanding what the future holds before we speak about and with the people that help us create the future. Repurposed jewellery saw an increase of 90% in searches according to the 2020 Conscious Fashion Report by List. And the searches for ethical jewellery went up by 60%. One example of a, of a jewellery brand working successfully with recycled materials is one of our exhibitors. It's the Phoenix Design Group. They're based in Thailand and they manufacture cutting edge jewelry exclusively from recycled silver collaboratively with retail and e-commerce brands, including ASOS, Monsoon and the Foschini Group. And it's not just the costume jewelry that is experiencing an uptake in sustainability. According to the industry update, by 2025, we expect sustainability influenced purchases to be accounted for 20 to 30% of all fine jewelry sales. And this is an equivalent, by the way, of 70 to 110 billion. And it's not just jewelry that is seeing a shift in consumer appetite for sustainable products. According to fashion search engine list, again, demand for secondhand and pre-owned fashion pieces increased substantially with sneakers, watches, handbags, the most searched categories alongside those keywords. And of course, Veja, Jackie Ashi and Anya Hindmarch, we know their names. And with that very short trend overview, I'm now handing over to Tamsin. Thank you, Laurel. All going in the right direction. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce Victoria Wall to this session as our first speaker, um, somebody I've worked with for many years and who's part of the origin story of the Ethical Fashion Forum and uh, one of the, you know, the first people to be operating in sustainable jewellery. Um, so really quite a mine of knowledge. Victoria, could you tell us a little bit more about what you do with VMV Consulting? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, was that a deliberate pun there? A mine <laughs> of information. Gold mining is a topic close to. Um, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, it, it's great that we've got Zoom and this ability to connect with people all over the world. I'm enjoying looking at people introducing themselves, popping up in all sorts of different places. It's just a shame I can't see so many of you, but hopefully you're out there and you're listening and, and go to enjoy what we're talking about today. Uh, so my, my name is Victoria War and I run a small um, sustainability consultancy practice um, in the UK but operating globally um, and we support fashion and jewellery businesses to think about their strategy and to work more responsibly 
we work with businesses from from very tiny startups to, to kind of big established international brands and we look at um, things around risk analysis, strategy development, responsible sourcing, helping to build supply chains, all, all sorts of things, kind of big, big spectrum of things. Um, and alongside that, I also um, work with two other organizations, Considered Jewelry and Sourcing Sustainably, that then help brands to put some of their strategies into into practice into work so helping them to helping businesses to source fair trade cotton fair trade gold um, from supply chains around the world and actually develop product and bring it to market um, i i will when i finish talking i'll put links to all of those in the in the chat so you can have a look at them um, as part of my work at vmv i've also recently become a b leader um, that is a consultant who is able to take businesses um, through the B Corp certification um, scheme. Um, so alongside kind of work with fair trade and responsible jewellery, I'm also able to support businesses to become B Corporations, which is quite exciting and is a certification scheme that's really taking off in the fashion and jewellery world at the moment. Um, and then with my kind of fourth hat on, um, I'm also a member of Fair Luxury. Um, which is um, an organization of, of like-minded um, jewelry professionals who are campaigning, supporting, educating the industry to do better, to work in a more responsible way. Um, and we have a couple of initiatives um, that we're working on at the moment that people um, on this call might be interested in. One is the Fair Luxury Pledge, which is all about getting businesses to commit to doing something different something better in their business this year and you can make a pledge on the fair luxury website to be part of that community and support each other to achieve their action over the, the next few months and we're also working on a big survey of jewelers um, working with specifically with gold at the moment to understand the demand for, for um, responsibly sourced gold um, and we'll use the output of that um work to um put a bit of pressure on suppliers across the jewelry industry to do more around responsible sourcing and to start offering more products um, that jewelers want so that's that's kind of a snapshot of who i am and, and what i'm doing at the moment it's quite a lot i appreciate <laughs> thank you well you are doing a lot and it's it it's wonderful um so just one point on b corp that it is actually the highest ranking um opportunity for you on co if you have a b corp certification ah. you get a higher uplift than any other certification and that's because it covers the entire business all of your operations so if you're a jewelry business i would or any sort of business in the fashion sector i'd very much recommend you look into b corp um, so uh, my first question to you victoria um what do you think are the the three most important things that jewelry brands should consider jewelry or accessory brands should consider when planning their sustainability strategy yeah it's i mean it's a big thing isn't it thinking about your sustainability strategy when you start thinking about it it's kind of it, it's a ma massive thing where do i start where you know what am i what should i do first where should i prioritize um and i think from the businesses that i've been working with it always works best if you look at what you're passionate about so you recognize that you can't do everything from day one if you're developing a strategy, it just makes sense to do stuff that you're passionate about. So, so think about your values as a business, what really motivates you when you get out of bed on a morning um, and, and try to focus on areas of sustainability that really resonate with you because you're more likely to take action and follow it through if it's something that excites you um, and something that you can get your team excited about. Um, Alongside that, I think, and you, you've just kind of said this, Tamsin, it's, you know, it's looking at your business as a whole and not just looking at your product. Again, a lot of the businesses that I work with come to me for support on responsible sourcing. Where can we get better materials from? How can we find ethical producers? And those are really important things. And obviously, as a, a business that's producing a product, that is going to be front and foremost in your mind. But that's not the be all and end all when it's when you come to running a business. There's lots of other things that you've got to think about as well beyond just the product. So the governance of, of your business, how it's set up, how you consume energy, what your carbon footprint is there's a kind of bigger picture so I think at the start of creating a strategy take a step back and kind of you know get get a 
flip chart out or some, you know, something where you can draw really big, segment up your business into all the different bits of it, all the different components that make it work and have a look at where the, there are strengths and opportunities and potentially risks in each of those. Um, and don't just focus on, on the product. Um, I think that the most inspiring businesses that I see at the moment are the ones that are going beyond just, just products and are actually giving something back into the communities around them. So partnering up with, with you know, people local to them or doing something really innovative around waste with people nearby. Um, it, it, it gives you a lot more talk to talk about, I think, if you can embed sustainability more widely across your business. Um, and then the third thing I, I was going to say was when you're putting a strategy in place, make sure it's realistic and give yourself really clear, small, incremental targets to work towards. Um, that not only helps you to plan and to drive yourself forward, but it also means that in 12 months time, when you've done all this hard work, you can look back and really analyze the progress that you've made. That not only keeps you motivated, but also it's something you can communicate to your, your customers with real honesty. This is what we were doing last year and look how much we've improved this year. You know, it's a journey. Um, so just make sure that you're noting down all of those little achievements along the way so that you can talk about them in the future. And if you did decide to, to work with a scheme like B Corp, you know, that's the sort of information that they're going to be looking for as part of that certification process. It's, you know, how are you progressing and what are you doing over time? Um, so, yeah, so those are the kind of things I would think about if I was starting my sustainability strategy. And you can find further resources on that because we've worked with Victoria of the MV to create a jewellery hub on Co. Um, which you'll see that there'll be a link in the chat so you can find out more about that. There's resources in there, um, also suppliers, and there's a there's a tool to help you build that strategy. Um, it, you can also use a sustainability roadmap tool on Co, which can help you to achieve that. Um, so Victoria, can you tell me what opportunities do you see that are not being met in the jewel and accessories sector? So what are buyers looking for? And I thought it was interesting that you look said and you need a more holistic approach quite often we find that entrepreneurs businesses overlook the products itself when they're so focused on sustainability so yeah do you see any particular opportunities Interesting. um i well i think and, and this is great because lauren just talked about this in his trends section so I, I know i'm on the right lines the, the opportunities that i'm i'm seeing at the moment um over, around jewelry and accessories are really that kind of middle of the market um, we, we work a lot with fine jewellery in our business um, and there are, you know, there's a lot of work going on there to improve the, the sector. And that's mainly because of, you know, the advent of things like fair trade gold and fair mind gold, you know, the schemes that are making it easier for businesses to take control of their supply chains. But they're, you know, gold, gold diamonds, gems, all of those things are very high value. And so it tends to be the fine jewellery um, area that are making the most progress uh, it, is what we've found. So for me, there's an opportunity out there for that kind of middle of the market, slightly more fashion jewelry to do a lot more, um, I think. And the, the business that I'm kind of in the process of launching at the moment, Considered Jewelry is designed to try and address that. It's designed to, to support businesses um, who want to produce fashion jewelry. So maybe, you know, plated jewelry with a, on a brass base, on a base metal base. Um, so I think that there's, there's definitely scope for innovation there. And, and just kind of bringing that price point down a bit, because obviously fine jewellery is lovely, but, you know, we can't all afford to be wearing 500 pound earrings. You know, sometimes we want, we want something that's a little bit more cost effective to treat ourselves. And whilst we don't want to be promoting fast fashion, fast jewellery turnaround, the, you know, we do have to respect that not everybody has those big luxury budgets. So I think there's opportunity for brands to kind of make headway in that regard. And, and also, again, moving away from, consumption and fast production of jewellery, um, accessory hire schemes, so rental, the rental market for, for jewellery, there's some quite interesting things happening around that at the moment and, and still opportunity, I think, for, for businesses um, to, to get in there on that. Thank you. Yeah, definitely scope there. I think we haven't seen much on that. I'd love to see some innovation in that sector coming from some yeah. of our members. Um, so my final question, can you share examples of brands that you that have managed to integrate real impact for people and planet with commercial success? The success, so they've they've achieved the three dimensions of people, planet, and profit, and and how have they done it? 
yeah so I, so I had a thought about this before before joining the call and the two that I kind of picked just to talk about very briefly uh, they're both jewellery rather than accessories I'm sure we've got lots of varied people on the course so sorry to focus on jewellery um but I'm I, I, I'd like to reference on I'll try while I'm on the while I'm talking to you I'll try and put these links in the chat um Yala jewellery is is um a great brand to have a look at um they are a B Corp certified jewellery brand, one of the first in the UK. They work in Kenya with um, communities of people in, in Kenya to preserve traditional skills um, and to produce a, a line of fashion jewellery um, from reclaimed materials over there. But they, for me, they just took a really nice balance of taking traditional skills, you know, working with the people in that country that have got those skills and creating product that's really commercial and right for a you know wider market than than, than just in Africa um and and the fact that they're B Corp as well means that again it's not just about the product it's about the whole way that they're running the business which is which is great and then the second one just to mention um is much more close to home because I'm in the north of England and this brand is Anuka Jewellery um which is based in Cheshire um and it's a the, the woman who read, runs it Francesca it's a very small business um but it, for me she's proving that even though you're small and you're doing kind of everything yourself and business is really you know really full on you can still take time to really address every aspect of your business to ensure that it's it's being as positive as it, as it can for people and planet so she's using recycled metals um in her pieces or fair mind gold so she's supporting artisanal miners through buying fair mined gold for her business um, and she's completely transparent about everything she's doing and partners with the um, provenance traceability system which I know Co has had some involvement with in, in the past um, so if you look at her website you can click through using provenance's apps on her website to see exactly where her materials came from who produced them it's there's evidence to show how she paid for things and um everything is kind of has proof points attached to it so it's it, it, i just think she's a really nice inspirational business to have a look at if, particularly if you're a small business wanting to see how you could kind of take sustainability and put it you know in the foundations of everything you do thank you so much so you can see the two links those two businesses in the chat and Victoria, if you wanted to post a link to your survey as well, I'm sure um, yes, members of this do. room would be interested in participating in that. I will and do. certainly it's a really good point um, regarding um, the success of some of these jewellery brands. We've seen that for a lot of the suppliers, it can be an easier place to start jewellery and accessories when it comes to creating products that sell and meet market needs. Um, so now I'm going to pass on to one of the brands that has done that, um, one of our exhibitors today, um, Ammo Jewelry. And so, Madeline, if you would, could you unmute yourself? We'd love to hear a little bit about your mission. And if we could navigate to the Ammo Jewelry slide, that would be great. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. And um, I've really enjoyed listening to all of your presentations, actually. Um, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so the ammo mission, uh, well, actually it's morphed and changed over the years, uh, but here in 2021, our mission is to basically address issues of poverty by empowering vulnerable women to become their own designers. So very much like my personal story of learning jewellery design, um, I wanted to pass that on to people in Cambodia who generally don't even get through high school or they have a very difficult start in life. So um, we provide a vocational training program um, so that young and disadvantaged people can uh, learn jewellery making skills. So it starts off really grassroots. Um, but the point is to help them graduate to having their own dreams, their own identity and their own kind of mission of their own. So it's trying to tap into each individual person to see really what makes them tick. Um, and then just kind of nurturing that through the mentorship training that I do with them. Um, but it's, it's like I said, it's a work in progress um, and we keep sort of reassessing that mission uh, particularly since the pandemic, we've had to 
really reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, but the mission's stronger now, uh, particularly as I had to leave Cambodia in a suitcase overnight on a panic plane, uh, and have learned how to create mentorship opportunities digitally and remotely when none of them had even learned digital and technical skills. All I'd done was teach them how to make jewelry before. And we've learned all of these Zoom and WhatsApp and <laughs> technical digital things. So yeah, the mission is very much about digital upskilling for, for Cambodians now. Is there anything else you'd like to share about your products or services for the audience? Yeah, um, well, our inspiration for our products actually comes directly from our name Ammo, which is short for ammunition. So um, we re recycle uh, spent bullet casings um, and transform that into fairly made fashion jewellery. Um, so it's very fun, contemporary, sort of a low or mid price point, really for about 16, age 18 to 65 year olds. But um, we've had to really change our products as well because all of our customers came into Cambodia as tourists, but those customers are all gone. So we've had to reinvent all of our designs to be for online customers in Europe, America, Japan, um, and really learn all about exporting. So actually we've had to move our business model from B to C over to B to B. And that's been really fascinating for us. Um, and it's totally changed our design aesthetic as well. So, you know, now we're making much sleeker lines, we're doing gold plating, we're bringing in silver and uh, sort of locally sourced gemstones. So we started off with these little recycled bullets, very cute. And now we're doing this more high end sort of branded jewelry with, with clients. So our products have evolved quite differently in the last year too. But it's basically recycled brass, silver, gemstones, gold plated, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, do you want to share some very quickly, we're, I, I'm conscious of time because we want to give people enough time in the breakouts and we've had a few questions in the chat. If you have a look at these afterwards, um, you might want to answer them there. Um, but anything you want to say about your your impact through what you've achieved? Yeah, um, I've been quite reflective about that since coming back to the UK and keeping the business going. Like, have we made an impact? Has it worked? Is it working? How are we going to keep doing that now that, you know, uh, things have changed so much? But I mean, since 2014, uh, with the workshop that I built, we've provided a safe and nurturing environment for these young people where they can just feel safe. And, and, you know, we really encourage them just to be creative and express themselves. And I think actually that's the greatest impact. Yes, we've made awesome jewelry, but it's more about how these young people have changed from working with us. So, you know, some of them have come from orphanages or they've have got a disability. But when they leave the ammo workshop for whatever job they want to do next, because we're encouraging them to go on and do their own thing. We don't want to keep them with us if they want to do something different. We'll help them with their life skills. But they go out quite sassy young people and they've bought their own motorbikes. They've got mobile phones and they're going out there and being change makers. So for me, that's really the impact. But um, three of our uh, apprentices have now gone on to set up their own jewellery businesses and we're still mentoring and helping them with that um, and we won a, a grant this year from Nomi Network um, for three thousand uh, dollars which has helped my manager start her own business and you're not going to believe this but she's actually selling more jewellery with her designs than I am with mine so <laughs> I think that's basically uh, well that's uh, just like wild I can't <laughs> believe that <laughs> That's that's so. In fact, she's now empowering me and the rest of our artisans because she's employing my jewelers to make her jewelry to make her sales. Wow. So it's kind of the mission's like working. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to make myself redundant on that on that <laughs> point and let her take over. Um, final question: Any recommendations for those here on working with small groups, creating great great products, and having impact? Anything you've learned that you would like to share, things you might not do again or would do again? 
uh, we haven't got enough time to tell you all the things I wouldn't do again. <laughs> but um, one of the main things I wanted to sort of bring across is that when I went to university to learn design, I learned nothing about business. And I had no idea the amount of man hours it takes to do the admin of running a business. But from a brand's perspective, they think that our production house is just making jewellery. But there's so much time that needs to be taken on the communication between me as the, the one with the brand and then trying to translate what's in their head in Holland or Germany through to Cambodians in a in a second language in a developing country who haven't finished school. So it's my advice would be don't underestimate how much time is needed to, to communicate a sketch into a finished product. It's months and there's so many emails, <laughs> so many emails, prepare for a lot. <laughs> um, but I think actually um, also what I'd recommend to brands very briefly is to uh, keep it fun, keep it lighthearted and keep things open to interpretation and allow that extra time for mistakes to turn into an opportunity. Very much that's happened in Cambodia my entire life. One miscommunication has actually turned things in a different direction and created another story. So that's that's what's the most fun about working in Cambodia is that it, everything's unexpected and you just kind of roll with the, the chaos really. I like a little bit of madness with jewelry design. <laughs> Thank you. So you know who to work with if you want to have fun while creating <laughs> great products. A really inspiring, Madeline. Thank you. And just Thank to note so before I pass you to Andy, who's going to tell you a bit more and introduce you to the other supplies in the session. We've had quite a few questions in the chat. So if you are an exhibitor in the session or a supplier, have a look. Um, you may want to respond to those and connect with those individuals. Thank you. Go, Andy. Awesome. Um, so at common object, it's common objective. I've got the incredible job of championing the most sustainable suppliers on the planet. And so I'm super excited to, to introduce you to these jewelry and accessory exhibitors. First up, we have James Ince Umbrellas. They're a small family run manufacturer who've been making quality umbrellas for over 215 years. They're recognized as the longest established umbrella maker in the UK. They export worldwide and pride themselves in promoting a sustainable supply chain. And uh, now we're giving all of these exhibitors uh, a mere 60 seconds uh, to explain who they are. So Richard Ince, we'd love to hear from you uh, some more details, please. Thank you, Andy. That's very kind of you. And thank you for the opportunity to share my business here. Um, as, you, as you said, uh, we are um, a, a not long established business. Um, umbrellas are, are quite particular they, they they need fabric and metal and uh, and wood so we have to we have quite a lot of um essentially auditing to do of our products if we, if we can um so you know wherever possible we source um sustainable timber we're making sure that our finishing is done with water based and uh, lacquers and things like that um so yeah we're finding that uh, opportunities for customers are far more interested in this this detail over the last certainly in the last ten years, um, so we're 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 keen to to nail this down and to to sort of um, get this detail in front of our customers so they they can have that assurance that we're not we're not taking the mic and people are being looked after further back down our supply chain. Okay. Amazing, superb, brilliant. That's excellent. Now uh, there's a link in the chat uh, to the James Ince business profile. So if you click on that, anyone, then you can find out more. Um, they've, they've done some very cool things uh, around supplying to all sorts of uh, uh, movies and all sorts. So thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thank you, no problem. Next up, we've got La Tierra, and they're a registered social enterprise specializing in botanical printing, uh, batik block printing. They produce scarves and custom made products. Uh, La Tierra uses natural fibers and their dyes are natural azo free. Uh, so Lulu Suresh, who's their founder, uh, is now going to share some more. Thank you so much, Andy. 
So uh, we are a small social enterprise. We are based in Singapore. And we are very much an inclusive social enterprise in the sense that we work with uh, people from uh, different backgrounds, women who are marginalized and people with disabilities. And we work it on um, like how we get the order. We work, we gather more people and we customize products. So we are also trying to revive traditional techniques like party tie dye, pretty much like how Andy explained. And part of the proceed actually go back into the community to uh, provide um, more learning support and also for educational needs. So that's what we do. And we customize uh, our products for people. So we also upcycle products uh, where we have uh, some uh, organizations coming with, uh, you know, with, with, with their, uh, like uh, their uniforms or whatever. And then we try to make new products out of it and um, bring it back into the society. Yes. So that's a way of upcycling or recycling what we do. And our dyes are all mostly natural. Whatever we do on the scarves, we also do botanical printing where we use uh, leaves and flowers from nature to print. And uh, the colors are also like uh, insect waste from lac or like from uh, eucalyptus or onion skin. And um, yeah, pretty much more like that. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Lulu. You guys are smashing it on the 60 second front. This is brilliant. So there'll be a lot more opportunity to hear from these exhibitors in the breakout rooms at the end. Um, and again, you can click on the in the chat to their link and contact connect with them directly there. You can message them there. Uh, next up, we've got Phoenix Design Group. Phoenix's, vis Phoenix's vision is to carry out all supply chain requirements from start to finish using a sustainable and circular manufacturing approach. They are focused on renewable energy, waste management, closed water cycles, diversity inclusion, and using as little new natural capital as is possible. And so their managing director, Richard Perkins, will now tell us more. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Andy's just said, uh, we're based in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, I've been here for about 15 years now and set up Phoenix just over eight years ago. We use certified recycled silver for all of our production. Um, our factory is 90% powered by solar energy. Hopefully it will be up to 100% uh, by the end of this year once more solar panels arrive from Germany. We have also a 90% uh, waste water cycle, which is obviously huge at the moment in terms of waste water in the fashion industry, which is something that we're really, really proud of. We collaborate with lots of uh, retail uh, companies, large, small companies. We work with several charities also. Um, Choose Love Help Refugee Charity. We sponsor the British Paralympic Champ Charity and work with a Pat Foundation, which is a tree planting charity in the UK. Um, so yeah, so basically I've joined Common Objective because now obviously how business has changed within the last 18 months. Generally, I would get a lot of uh, my future business from exhibitions and places like that. But now things have gone digital. This is like the perfect platform for me to meet, meet like-minded businesses who are looking to become pioneers in sustainable fashion. Amazing. It's great to have you here, Richard. Thank you. Thank for that. you. A, lot, a lot to be proud of there. Um, and so next up, we have Woodbelt. Woodbelt is a not-for-profit business practicing principles of impact fashion whilst producing innovative patented wooden clasps for belts combined with other sustainable materials. Uh, hi, my name is Primoz. Uh, I'm a founder of a brand called Woodbelt. We are based in Slovenia. And uh, what we do is we produce belts which are uh, in a way unique. I'll show you the belts. Here is a belt and what you can see is uh, we produce the belts with the wooden clasps it's a patented craftsmanship innovation. Uh, and they are combined with different sustainable materials. In this case, it's leather, but it, it could be also cotton, hemp, cork, or any other sustainable materials. Uh, the belts that we produce have several advantages because they are based on what we call impact fashion philosophy. Uh, so they are very sustainable in a way. We try to produce them from the sustainable materials. They are innovative. And they are different because they have some functionalities that serve to the customer in a way. So there are no allergies on a metal. You don't need to take them off at the airports because they don't beep. And then the third uh, element that we are trying to follow is the social impact. They are easy to assemble. So we try to involve 
the vulnerable groups such as disabled, blind people, and so on, into the production phase. And also the whole model is based on the fair trade and on the social entrepreneurship model. So we are re really looking to partnership with the brands who share the same values as we. Perfect. Moving on to Trefino. Trefino are a supplier of the sustainable Corzo buttons. Ecuador is the only country in the world that produces and exports Tagua blanks for the manufacture of these amazing buttons. And since its inception in 1988, their company has supplied the most renowned button manufacturers and promoted the conservation of the forests where Tagua grows. So to tell us more is their executive president, Ignacio Alejandro Maya. Well, thank you, Andy. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ignacio. For 32 years, our company, Trafino, has been exporting Corozo blanks for the manufacture of buttons. I am delighted to share with you the fascinating story of how something as small as a button can help save forests, reduce the carbon footprint of the fashion industry, replace plastic, and improve the livelihoods of thousands of people in rural communities and artisans. I am talking about the most environmentally and socially responsible button there is, a 100% natural, wild origin, sustainable Corozo nut buttons. I would like to quickly highlight four main points about Corozo. It is an environmental product. Through its use, we defend tropical forests, allowing forest inhabitants to live off its biodiversity and become its best guardians. It is a social product. Thousands of Corozo nut collectors and hundreds of artisans live of Corozo, replaces plastic buttons, and there is the gender factor as well. Many of the artisans who process the nuts and collectors in the forests are women. In fact, Corozo buttons have been used since the 1850s by the most famous and prestigious clothing brands. We are talking about pure tradition here. We can find Corozo button manufacturers in more than 20 countries who make the most beautiful buttons using the raw material that Trafino exports. So the question uh, for the audience and the challenge is, how many other buttons can we name that are as eco-friendly and social as this one? Not to mention its uniqueness and elegance. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, everyone. Fantastic challenge for us. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Tanya Francisca. Uh, Tanya Francisca is a project formed by a group of Ecuadorian artisans, artists, and designers, and they produce 100% handmade collections, each one being unique. Uh, so I'm going to hand over now to the Tanya Francisca team who are going to tell us a little bit more. Hi, so again, can you guys hear me okay? Perfectly. Perfect. Um, I am, this is Tanya Francisca, and I am just the translator, but um, to share a little bit about what she does. It's a brand with a guarantee that each and every one of her creations represent a story, a moment, and an emotion. She has a task of recovering ancient and ancestral techniques, producing jewelry collections that stand the test of time due to their quality. They also take a, a stand against industrialization, lowering environmental impact, bettering the quality of life and providing wellness both to the producers and the clients. It's her belief that if the piece was successful in doing so, it gives something wholesome for the client to take part in as well by wearing something as intimate as jewelry, a piece of jewelry. Everything is sourced locally um, and recycled in most cases. Culture and identity play a major role in each design, taking inspiration from pre-Hispanic art existing in Ecuador and organic forms that have been around throughout history. Again, each piece is 100% made by hand. Um, and we, I'm trying to show a little bit, but the, the it's it's in the it's in the picture as well. But um, you can see some mix of the different materials, such as alpaca wool, um, seeds, and straw. That's very typical of the region. Uh, repeating that everything is locally sourced. Brilliant. Thank you. There'll be opportunity to share some of that in the breakout session. So some more visuals. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so moving on now, uh, finally, uh, to uh, Coco Handnits. Um, they exhibited in the Impact Pioneers session on day three, but also very relevant for this session. So uh, we're bringing them up here as well. Coco uh, stands for Knit One Garment, Change One Life. 
They are knitwear specialists. They are B Corp certified. B Corp was mentioned earlier in this session. Uh, and they make 100% hand knitted garments, each coming with a different story to connect consumers with their artisans. So with that, I hand back to Tamsin. Thank you. So on to the breakout section of the, the event. So this is your chance to connect, learn more about these uh, um, amazing suppliers, ask your questions direct. Um, and we've got two breakout rooms, one jewelry and two accessories. So in number one, you can find Ammo Designs, Phoenix Design, um, and Tanya Francisca. Um, and in number two, you can find um, La Tierra, Trifino, um, Wood Belt, and James Ince Umbrellas. And you can also, each of these will be hosted. We do have quite a hard stop at 5.50. So um, at that point, you'll be thrown back into this, into the main room. 